Welcome back to the Product-Led Growth Sales Development Podcast. It's a mouthful. I'm Justin Michael, your host. And we're very excited today to have Kyle Poyer join us, who is the VP of Growth at OpenView. They're really a leader in product-led growth, and we want to talk today about the intersection of sales, sales development, and product-led growth. How are you today, Kyle? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's awesome having you on. So let's start with definitions. This is kind of a new area. Uh, people have heard of product-led growth, but I want to get it from the source because I know your team's been putting out amazing content about this. Yeah, and my, uh, my colleague, Blake Bartlett, actually coined the term product-led growth back in 2016 based on investing in product-led growth businesses like Expensify, Datadog, and Calendly. He saw it as the future and how folks adopt software. And while there were a bunch of different names that touched on elements of product-led growth, right, like bottoms-up sales or consumerization of IT, B2C to B, there wasn't a community around it or a set of best practices. And so the way we look at it at OpenView is that product-led growth is an end-user oriented growth model that puts the product front and center in the way you acquire, convert, expand, and retain your customers. And so there's still obviously room for other functions, sales, marketing, other groups play a huge role as well, but it's a mentality around how to grow the business. I love that. I mean, I think of some things like Slack might be a good example of one of these product-led growth companies. Can you name some famous ones or not so famous ones or models that you like just to kind of jar people's memory? Slack is a great example. Folks can think about Zoom, Twilio, Datadog, Elastic. You could even put an AWS in that bucket. And some of the things to look out for, right, are that you're normally able to start as an individual user or as an end user adopting the product. And you're only able to start for free or you know, without much of a commitment from a price perspective and see value pretty quickly, reach your aha moment, and then you're able to kind of use the product more and more, bring in folks on your team and increase the value that you're getting and then pay more as you're seeing more value. And so it's, it's really in every industry and it's not necessarily like just premium companies or just viral companies. There's elements about of product like growth in a lot of businesses, but I'd say those are the top poster children to, to look at. I love it. So the big question becomes, do you even need salespeople? I mean, in the very beginning, if you nail the unique value proposition and the product market fit, it kind of seems to scale virally, almost like freemium through different seat licenses, or it's such an affordable way that people can individually buy it and then pass it along because it has high utility. There's this thing called Get Cloud App that takes screenshots that seem to have grown this way where people are passing it around and then they're doing team deals. So is that mythology that the sellers go away? Is, is like they're a model where you don't need sales development teams? The term we like to use is hire sales last. And so there's a role for sales. In fact, the top product-led growth businesses that have a self-service component to how they get revenue are actually hiring sales faster than the rest of their company after they go public. But they're not doing that early on in their growth, right? So there's still a role, but it comes at a different time. And the role, it looks different, right? So in product-led growth, kind of classic product-led growth company, you're attracting that individual user, right? You're marketing tech exchange too. So you're doing a lot more referrals, virality, word of mouth, SEO to bring in that first user then you're making sure that that user is successful in the product. And then that user hopefully gets some support to answer any questions they have, although that support is a mix of scalable support and FAQs. And hopefully that individual user turns into a team or multiple people inside of a company. And then over time, you start to kind of grow that team. But there's only so much that happens organically within a company, especially when you're looking at you know, a very large company, say, say you're a Microsoft, right? And, you know, this is a bad example, but let's say a pockets within Microsoft were adopting Slack. You know, why would they? But they probably actually are. You probably realize you have a bunch of different teams within the organization. Some maybe like the engineering team for a specific product. Some might be using and paying for Slack. Others might be using it for free. And then you're able to say, hey, here are the target accounts that We really have opportunities to expand into large enterprise deals. And we think that these companies need more help in the buying process because these are a lot more complicated. There's multiple teams, there's change management, there's security approvals. There's a lot of work that goes into getting that customer to be able to make that leap, right? And so that's where sales comes in. It's to expand these accounts in a really targeted way to go from that team sale to that company-wide sale. In a lot of cases, you are able to have the benefit of having a champion 
within the customer already because you're able to say, hey, these folks are power users. They're really active in the product every day. Here's maybe the most senior person we have on the account. So we have a VP who's active in the product. Let's go reach out to that person. And so instead of doing a bunch of you know, research on LinkedIn around who are the best contacts and how do you develop champions, you're able to navigate based on how folks are already using the product and who's using the product and really partner with them towards the shared goal. And the shared goal is taking this product that they already love to use and making it more widely available in the standard within their company. Yeah, I love that analogy because I know there's been like gain side into Tango and these platforms where you try to do, you know, customer success management and see how the SaaS is being used, software as a service. But now you can watch from the top of the funnel and the adoption of the product, who are the power users, right? You might some see some influential reps that just spend so much time in the product or going so deep with the feature sets that they become the obvious champion to pair together with that VP that's maybe logged in and taking a look and oversight. So I love how it can affect a strategy that it's more customer centric because you have a data backed approach to do it. I know Snowflake, I think is product led growth. Lars Nilsson's a mentor over there from True Ventures and he's now over there running a worldwide sales development. Do you interface with him? Do you think that's a good example company? I do think Snowflake is a great example of, of product led growth. And I think you can look at their net dollar retention. It's somewhere around 160% and say, hey, the product is playing a big role, especially on the expansion of customers and going from maybe an initial use case to growing that use case and finding more ways to adopt Snowflake. I think what is what is super interesting in these models is, is you start thinking about the strategies that a sales development team can use look really different from an outbound strategy because you're able to say, hey, we have a department or a business unit that's on Snowflake. How do we leverage that to take to get into these other business units or use cases that we think are, are important. Can we ask our existing champion for an intro? How do we have an internal case study that we can share with other teams? What can we do from a marketing perspective, maybe to retarget these folks because we know who the universe is. And it requires really though getting really sharp around how your customers are using the product and what messages are going to resonate with other folks rather than trying to kind of go after the cold buyer that doesn't necessarily know they have a problem yet and you're trying to educate them about the market and the space, this is a completely different engagement model for the SDR team. I think that's uh, tremendous. So what are the pitfalls? People jump into product-led growth and sales, You know, how do they align it with marketing? Or what are the, some of the mistakes people are making? Like if you have advice. Again, I have another question. What percentage of SaaS companies will be doing this? Is this going to be ubiquitous toward 2025, 2035? Or is it going to be you know, an 80-20 rule where it, it only works in some models? Yeah, as a starting point, we're seeing, I run OpenView's annual SaaS benchmark survey. And about a quarter uh, to a third of SaaS companies say that they are all in on product-led growth and it's fundamental to how they're going to grow. Although what's interesting is if you look at the companies that have gotten public in the last few years, about half of them have adopted product-led growth. So we think there's something in here that makes it so that you know, really great adoption of product-led growth makes a company in a better position to go public because they can grow even faster at scale and grow more efficiently than a traditional SaaS, SaaS business. In terms of some of the, the pitfalls, I think a lot of folks uh, wait too long to go from that end user self-service mentality to the ability to sell a market and into these larger enterprises. And I think it's because there's some aversion in some circles of hiring sales, right? So even in, Atlassian's another great poster child of product head growth, and in the early days, you know, no sales was to Atlassian what like no software was to Salesforce. It was essentially part of their ethos as a business. Their flywheel was about having low prices, really easy to use products, super transparent pricing and self-service purchasing. But now they actually have a fairly sizable uh, sales and, and SDR team. They call that team enterprise advocates. And it's because they realize that for a certain customer, part of reducing their friction in adopting the product is having someone to help them on that experience as a Sherpa who has done this before, who knows the pitfalls, um, who can educate them about the business value of the solution, can answer technical questions. And so I think for, for a lot of folks, this idea that product and sales and SDR are antagonistic. And I think the, the reality is that they should work together. And even just one, one kind of small example, 
in some product-led businesses, the product team might own the self-service revenue number. And so any company that was adopted through self-service and the SDR team calls on and converts into a larger deal, that could actually hurt the self-service number. And so you have to look at things like that and say, hey, where are their misalignments? Because we should have shared shared objectives and Growing an account should be a win, regardless of whether it's taking away from the quote unquote self-service number. That makes a lot of sense. So where does the SDR team fit into this strategy? So like distinctly, I'd love to get the puzzle pieces. We have a non-product-led growth SaaS company. Now we're going to put product-led growth. And what happens with, it's a big question, but marketing operations, field sales, and inside sales. Can you just walk me through how it gets redrawn? Is it just a shift with demand gen marketing and where the SDRs pick up or are there shifts that touch the entire revenue revenue supply chain? Well, there's really big changes in every function. I'd say from, a, from an SDR standpoint, you're only really looking at probably two different functions. You probably don't necessarily have an outbound SDR function that's totally getting net new leads. Folks are probably dealing with the inbound funnel. And the inbound is probably not your person who's downloaded an ebook on the website, right? It's someone who has either already been using the product and is qualified in your ICP as, hey, this is a, say you have a VP at Sony comes in and signs up for an individual account. You might want to put an SDR on that to generate a qualified opportunity with a sales rep for that deal. Because, you know, odds are too that that VP at Sony is probably not able to convert via self-service and they probably have a more complicated set of needs. And so you've got that set of inbound SDRs who are really working these highly qualified, ready to buy enterprises that are coming inbound. And then you've got your SDR team that's working on expansion from your existing user base, taking these teams at your target accounts and turning them into larger deals. And so in, in both cases, they're generating qualified opportunities for the sales team, but it's a difference in who they're working with, which means that the way the metrics that you want to look at for the team are going to be different, right? It's not about how many people did you call? How many emails did you send? Uh, you actually care a lot more about the customer experience and having a great customer experience for everyone you reach out to is more important than the volume of folks. The other thing is you're looking at more metrics like coverage. So what percentage of folks that reach this stage were you able to contact within three hours, within 24 hours of the time when they hit this stage rather than the pure volume? Because volume is not necessarily a, a metric that an SDR can influence. They can only influence how much coverage they're providing and how much of a, a customer experience they're able to, to offer for these, for these folks. And so you're starting to look at you know, clearly different ways of compensating folks, ways of identifying who is a lead, way of passing leads to the sales team. And the product to sales or SDR handoff becomes really critical. And that's where having a strong uh, growth and or rev ops function comes in handy. Say your growth function in, in many ways operates more like what a sales ops team would operate like in a traditional software business where they're owning the funnel and they're really architecting what that customer journey looks like, knowing that most folks are starting with a product usage or uh, signing up for the product rather than starting with sales engagement or the demo as the first step. Yeah, we almost moved to a fully inbound model because people are already using the product. Is that going to create enough funnel? I mean, I'd argue it's stickier, right? Because if you're just doing white paper downloads, you have to separate the wheat from the chaff and go through hundreds of leads to get to, you know, even trial users or you've, it's kind of like you put the cart before the horse, they're already in the product, they're already using it. Is that achieved through advertising? What does the funnel look like to actually get them in using it? Is it word of mouth? Is it kind of like Slack where people tell their friends and, and bring them in? Is it a pure viral word of mouth move? Or can it be influenced with like deft advertising, very top funnel, like native ads on LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, AdWords? Is it just a combination of all the top funnel, funnel marketing antics? Yeah, so I'd say like there's a blessing and a curse, right? Where by being able to reach an individual and an account instead of that executive buyer, you're opening up the number of people that can use your product by 10x, in some cases by 20, 30, 40x. And so the challenge is that you're not going to be able to pay the same cost per lead that you can pay in a traditional sales model. So moving towards like trade shows and expensive outbound tactics just aren't going to fly. You have to be reliant on a high velocity organic demand gen strategy. 
And that usually means some combination of SEO, word of mouth and, and referrals, and then ideally product partnerships. And so being found in other app stores or being, having, being found in the context of an integration with another piece of software that the customer is using. And all of those need to be low cost of acquisition. You know, you can accelerate with some paid, some SEM, some display, some retargeting, but that's not where you want the majority of your leads to be coming from. You want that to augment that kind of healthy organic motion rather than be the core motion. And some things to be thinking about are that if you put yourself more in that user shoes, the user is probably not searching for things like, you know, to bring us a sales example, a sales rep is probably not going, what is the best CRM tool for my business? They might be thinking about, hey, meeting scheduling is really annoying. Like, how do I schedule more prospect meetings faster? Or I hate taking notes and sticking them to Salesforce, like note taking app for sales. And they're searching for more of these everyday pain points that they experience in their job. And so you want to be found in the context of when people are experiencing that pain rather than necessarily just when they're searching for a software product to purchase. I think a company that does this really well is Zapier. And so Zapier is a middleware platform that connects different applications with each other. And you're probably not finding Zapier by searching like API integration software. But what happens is, hey, you want to connect your Typeform account with your HubSpot account. So if someone signs up as a contact, you get them to, to, uh, to be part of your HubSpot database. Well, you ser- start to search for that. And Zapier has amazing landing pages around specific ways that you might want to integrate the two products, as well as the products themselves. And so you'll probably land on one of those pages, read instructions about how to connect the two, and then you can hop in and start using Zapier to do that in a really personalized and elegant way. And I believe if the data still holds, about 60% of their traffic comes from organic search. And so that's something that you can do because you're able to really open up the top of funnel and the amount of use cases that you're able to bring into the product. And that user that starts out searching for a Typeform HubSpot integration Maybe later they search for the type form Salesforce integration and then HubSpot and Salesforce. And then you can start you know, seeing pockets where there's a lot of activity and success being found in that, in that customer, but it starts in a really simple, simple way. Yeah, I love that term ZMOT, the zero moment of truth, where there's the intent to solve a problem. Then you just go on the internet and you write your problem into Google and then you run into a product and you have low friction to be able to either get it free and start using it to fix the problem or get it affordably. And then some friends have the problem, so you shoot it around. And so it all moves like Hotmail to me, if I think in the narrative arc of, I've been looking at technology for 25 years now. So it's really fascinating. And I mean, I think even to that point, we've seen huge, huge growth in the Shopify app store, right? As And for Shopify merchants, they're equivalent to Google as the Shopify app store. So if they're already on Shopify, they're growing their business, and they're like, hey, I want to be able to text my customers. They're probably finding that on the Shopify app store. Or, hey, I want email marketing for Shopify. And so you see businesses like Klaviyo, which just does email marketing for e-commerce, reach unicorn valuations. And a lot of their growth is driven by folks on the Shopify ecosystem. And so for you know, if I'm in the, your audience's shoes, I, I think about not just Google, I'd like Google and search are probably the number one channel for a lot of PLG companies, but think about where your customers are searching for those problems and who they're asking. And that might be another technology company that might be friends of theirs, that might be on like communities like Reddit, and that's where you want to make sure that you're super present in that moment. What are the resources to learn about this stuff? I've been seeing a couple of different books on the market. I'm going to read them and interview their authors. But you know, who's writing about this stuff? Blogging. I know OpenView is putting on some great stuff. Lead us, lead the horse to water here. We're interested. Well, I highly recommend OpenView's materials. We we put out content every day, oh, nearly every day, on the OpenView blog. That's openview.vc, and then just go to our blog. And a, a few others I'd call out would be, you know, Blake Bartlett on LinkedIn. So Blake's a colleague of mine. He has a PLG 123 video series where he recaps some of the most important trends that are happening each week around product led growth. And then Wes Bush is another kind of co conspirator in this PLG movement. And he's created a, a practice around product led growth, has a really large Slack community that he runs of practitioners. And so that's a great source for folks looking to learn more. I love it. Anyone specifically talking about the realm of sales and product-led growth 
or is that kind of always part of what you're consulting on and trying to nail that piece? It's a piece that I think everyone in that group is is touching on. One other person I, I, to guide people to would be Liz Kane, who partner at OpenView. And previously, she ran the global SDR, BDR team at NetSuite and built it from zero to 170 people and then had been in OpenView for the last five years. And so she's actually really sharp in thinking about both uh, high-performing sales development teams, but then also what product-led growth means for that, that organization. Awesome, man. Well, I'd, I'd love to have you back on the show. It's kind of an early episode. You've educated us a lot, given us resources, given us some great imaginative ideas. And then we hope to have you back once this thing catches fire. And there's a lot more talk about uh, orchestrating sales motions inbound, outbound. Last question would be, is, is there a role for outbound in product-led growth? Could you conceive of that? I mean, is that that's the motion that the inbound came in, you've identified your champions, and then you call back out and corral them into a into a relevant call, I'm thinking. I think for me, outbound is more about the expansion within your target accounts, right? So if you have, like, if we'll go to the Sony example. If you see that you've got 20 users at Sony, you can go bottoms up and call your existing users and try to get introductions. Or you can go and see, hey, who would be probably the most likely buyer and reach out to them for that. And, and that's essentially warm outbound because it's outbound, but to a company that's already using the product, but to a person that's not. And so you have to be really thoughtful in how you do that message. I think being personalized, using the insights that you already have on what folks are doing in the product helps. And that's that's been a valid strategy to complement some of the, the product-led growth efforts and, and inbound efforts. Well, you've been great, Kyle. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can people find you? It's Kyle Poyer, P-O-Y-A-R, OpenView. Any other websites or blog? Uh, yeah. Well, follow me on LinkedIn. I put out a bunch of content regularly about product-led growth and you can find it all there. Amazing. Thanks everyone for listening to the product-led growth sales development show on 10bound.com. I'm Justin Michael, your host, and we will have Kyle Poyer back. Have a great day. Thanks again.